I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've been having a great week and I hope you've been pursuing your physical best performance. If it's your first time joining us on the Physical Performance Show, then a massive welcome. If it's your 86th time, then a massive and mighty welcome back. Listeners, today's guest is Dr. Christopher Vichulo. And Dr. Vichulo joins us as the program's fourth expert edition. First, we started with Peter Maliaris, Dr. Peter Maliaris, tendon researcher and physiotherapist before we proceeded to Rich Willie, also a physical therapist in the US and prolific running researcher. And most recently, we featured Professor Belinda Beck on all things bone health for athletes. Dr. Chris Vichulo is a specialist orthopedic knee surgeon based out of the Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine Center here on the Gold Coast. Dr. Chris Vichulo is associate professor. He's also been a knee orthopedic specialist since 2001 and performs over a thousand knee procedures every year. Dr. Vichulo is involved in the treatment of elite athletes and professional sports teams with a particular interest in complex ACL and PCL reconstructions computer-navigated total and revision surgery, minimal incision rapid recovery, total and partial knee replacement, meniscus repair, preserving arthroscopy, advanced arthroscopic joint resurfacing and cartilage restoration. Dr. Vichulo has actually been my surgeon on two occasions over my running slash triathlon lifespan, and I've been a very happy patient of, of his. But listeners, on today's episode, I really want to catch up with Dr. Vichulo to talk through all things knee health. And that's exactly what we do in this episode. We dive deep on all things related to sports injuries, injuries in youth, injuries of age, osteoarthritis, cartilage defects, future trends, surgical trends, PRP, you name it. If you've got a question about knees, knee injuries, and preserving your knees for the future of your sporting endeavors, then this is something that you're absolutely going to want to dive deep into. I suggest you get a pen and paper out, take notes. If you know someone listeners in advance that's going to get a lot out of this episode, then it would mean a lot if you could forward this on to them. But let's jump straight in with Dr. Chris Vichulo on an expert edition on all things knees. So I've been looking forward to this one, sitting down with a gentleman that I've known in the healthcare space for for years and certainly someone that uh, professionally, you know, I respect enormously for the outcomes uh, that that he achieves. And that's Dr. Chris Vichulo, who uh, is probably best known as the knee surgeon. So uh, Chris, great to have you on a Friday afternoon. Thanks, Brad. It's great to be here for my first podcast ever. Very exciting. I feel very honoured. Chris, uh, your background, I mean, since I've known you, you've always just been the knee guy, the go-to knee guy. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got into medicine and then your trajectory to get to, you know, what you currently focus on, which is knees. Yeah, so I'm an orthopaedic surgeon and obviously orthopaedic surgeons deal with all manner of musculoskeletal injury and surgery. And I've subspecialised in knee surgery. And how that came about is essentially uh, I was at school deciding what to do. I put down medicine as my first choice. I think engineering was my second and then law. And I got into medicine. And like all things, explaining where people end up in their lives, it's often a convoluted trail. I didn't start out planning to become a knee surgeon. It's just how it happened over time. So I did medicine and I liked surgery. I liked, then decided I liked orthopaedic surgery, and then in orthopaedic surgery, I decided I liked knee surgery. I also liked uh, doing foot and ankle sports injuries as well. 
And as part of that, I went overseas after finishing my orthopedic training in, uh, in Queensland and went to Canada. I did a joint replacement fellowship, we call it. So it's extra training in joint replacement surgery in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. And then I went to Duke University in North Carolina and did uh, essentially lower limb sports there. So it was knee sports and uh, some foot and ankle sports surgery. And I came back and joined uh, a very well-regarded orthopedic uh, knee surgeon, Steve Rackerman, here. And we st- I joined him in practice uh, probably around 2001 on the Gold Coast is where I grew up. And I came back and joined him. And, uh, and that's sort of how I ended up where I was. Steve retired about 10 years ago through ill health. And uh, I've continued on, currently doing my PhD in knee replacement, which is interesting, and uh, I should be able to submit my thesis next year. And we uh, set up a uh, not-for-profit knee research, Knee Research Australia, about three or four years ago now, and we're doing a lot of uh, research in a number of areas. So some of the areas are sports injury prevention, so actually stopping young people, particularly under 25 year olds having any knee injuries at sport because we've got a growing epidemic of that and the second thing is uh, we look at is knee replacements and outcomes of knee replacements improving the outcomes of knee replacements and the next is improving outcomes of knee reconstruction so we're doing a lot of biomechanical work there and outcome studies and then the final thing is we're doing some stem cell work with um University of Queensland, STEM care. And we're doing a very exciting project looking at, it's really basic science, but it's all about why do people's knees age? And so we're um, patients we're doing knee operations on who have volunteered to uh, donate some of their bone and tissue at the time of the surgery. And we're doing some very exciting work looking at the genetics of ageing, particularly joint tissues. You know, why do people age? Why is a seven-year-old person's knee much different to a 20 year old and then why do they have this why do they lack any uh, ability to heal the joint injuries that's often 20 year olds can so we're looking at the basic science and understanding of uh trying to unlock the secrets about dna and rna in the in the knee joint but that really goes on to any joint because it's all sort of similar aging in the body so uh and you sleep (laughs) chris uh what's a typical week look like though just on you for for a moment i mean how many days you in a in surgery and theater versus Uh, consoling patients yeah so essentially you're half the week in the theater and half the week consulting uh seeing patients and then fridays i usually have it's a research day so i'll uh, do research or catch up on other things Up until recently, I was a secretary of the Australian Knee Society, and that was taking up a lot of my time. I've now um, moved out of that role, so I'm back on mainly doing my PhD and uh, research around it. And uh, also an avid cyclist. I know you uh, like to pedal a few Ks in the week. Uh, You've been riding bikes for quite a few years, haven't you? Yeah, I used to race uh, here on the coast when I was a teenager at Narang, which was Narang Cycle Club. And then, um, and that club now has just become finally, uh, I think it's a Gold Coast uh, Cycling Club, and that's an amalgamation of a few different clubs. So yeah, I cycle about three or four times a week. Uh, and we're training currently. I've just started. We're going to Spain next year. We're going to cycle from Girona to San Sebastian across the Pyrenees and via Andorra. So. I need to get very fit for that because uh, currently I'm not that fit. <laughs> and uh, and Chris, just something that you mentioned, you had a love, found a love for orthopedics. What was it about orthopedics that appealed to you? Well, the, the good thing about orthopedics is that you actually really change people's lives. Um, you know, and the key is you can take someone like with a terrible knee and replace it, and it's just a life changing thing for them. And, and professionally, it's very rewarding. You get someone and, and they you replace their knee, and they get a really good outcome, and they're super happy, and, and they say, "Look, you've changed my life," and that is really rewarding. Other areas of medicine, uh, I didn't really find that great because you don't have such a profound and uh, pragmatic effect on people's lives. So orthopedics is good, and also. I do like biomechanics and uh, engineering, and so I work with a lot of bioengineers, so I find the bioengineering and the biomechanics side of it very interesting. 
So the, basically, the, those two things, it's the, what we do and, then, uh, and the changes we make to people's lives that I find really enjoyable. And uh, on the subspecialty into knees, I mean, obviously, a lot of orthopedic surgeons can be lower limb, upper limb, and that's sort of where they tend to you know, steer their careers. It always seemed to me quite forward thinking just in terms of saying, right, I'm, I'm focusing on the knees. Was there any for you, is that a major sort of like you losing the foot and ankle, which you, you mentioned that you enjoyed, or uh, was it always uh, just like, no, that's what I love and that's what I'm going to stick with? Uh, look, I think if you're going to call yourself a knee surgeon, it's probably better not to do anything else. And so if someone comes in and need a hip replacement, I'll refer them to colleagues because on the Gold Coast here we have some excellent surgeons. So uh, I th- I personally thought it was better just to stick to one thing. It really down, down to preference. Some surgeons wouldn't like to do that. They like to do a variety of operations, and I think that's great too. It just depends on the person. Uh, I have a real research interest, so just focusing on one area really works for that because you can really be very uh, focused and do some you know, life world-changing research around what you do. But there is a, a you know, people who are general orthopedic surgeons, that is a fantastic thing, and we, and we need them. We need general orthopedic surgeons too, so we need all, all types. You know, everybody can't, well, everybody doesn't want to be a subspecialist, and there's excellent surgeons who are. Yeah. Chris, uh, let's get practical for listeners' sake. I mean, um, uh, I'm just going to change my order here, and uh, you mentioned something that you're researching around why people's knees age. Can you put listeners in a, you know, share a few of the, uh, the research insights here or your thoughts clinically around what the key drivers of the age in knee are? So the, the main two, one is you can do something about and one you can't. And the main one you can do something about is your weight. So for every five kilograms you're over your ideal weight, your knee osteoarthritis risk goes up double. So if you're 10 kilos over, it's four times. Um, and so people come in 20, 30 kilos overweight, their risk of knee osteoarthritis is much, much higher. Now, some people are more resistant to getting it because they've got less genetic risk. So the second thing is genetic risk. And it really boils down to, you know, if you're one of your parents have had a knee replacement and you know, you've had a knee injury or you, you, you get a degenerative tear of your meniscus, you're much more likely to end up with a knee replacement later on than somebody who hasn't had that genetic risk. Now, I do see a lot of people who've got arthritis, they're not overweight, their parents have never had it. So we don't quite understand all the reasons why people get it, but there are strong uh, risk factors we can identify for genetics and weight. And then the third thing is injury. Uh, so if you tear your ACL at when you're 15 or 16 and a meniscus, your risk of knee osteoarthritis is about seven to 10 times higher from that injury. And so that's why We've been focusing on you know, young people who have knee injuries and trying to prevent it because it's such an important area. You can essentially take a normal young person, they're playing touch football and they step uh, and they tear their ACL and that changes them for the rest of their life. You can reconstruct them but the knee's never quite as good and you can't make their risk of knee osteoarthritis go back to being the same. So it's essentially uh, completely uh, well, highly preventable but the, the outcome of it, particularly tearing a meniscus or an ACL to a young person, is, is, is terrible. And so, as you say, one, you know, injury can hopefully put some measures into prevent or lessen the risk, which we'll touch on. Uh, genetics, you know, uh, unchangeable uh, at this stage. <laughs> and, uh, and weight, obviously, highly changeable. As a physiotherapist, I often see in the consulting room with patients that dilemma where they're in pain, it's part of that vicious cycle where the weight gain's been you know, accruing because their activity levels are less and uh, they know they need to lose it. I mean, um, uh, any tips for listeners from, you know, uh, from your desk on how to best navigate that, given that it makes such a difference to their risk of joint wear and tear? Well, I don't pretend to be a good expert in getting people to lose weight and it's hard. We actually... Um we have a nurse practitioner in our office, and, uh, and Jules, and she's fantastic. And it depends on the person, but there's a lot of issues around psychology, habits, uh, you know, practices that you can change. When people's body mass index gets really high, like they're quite overweight, we're talking, uh, you know, they're sort of carrying around 50% extra of their body weight that they don't or shouldn't have then you start to talk about having uh, operations like sleeve gastrectomies, like bariatric operations. And 
a general surgeons, I'm not one of those, but I refer often patients on who are quite overweight, they've tried to lose weight for many years, and often at the end of the diet, they're actually heavier than when they started out, then uh, I often refer people off to uh, for sleeve gastrectomies and things like this. If people are that overweight, then, um, and they've got bad knees, and a lot of it's just getting them to change their exercise patterns, because a lot of people try and walk a lot but then they find their knees hurt so for those people it's much better to ride a bike either in a gym or on the road or in the park or you know, out in the bush on a mountain bike and that has multiple benefits because if you strengthen people's quadriceps uh, that has fantastic ability to improve their stair climbing function getting off chairs these sort of things and it also helps them lose weight you know because they do burn a lot of energy riding a bike so bike riding is our the go-to uh, exercise for people with knees that are arthritic and you, you can really turn someone around who's overweight uh, say by 20 kilos or so and they've got some mild to moderate knee osteoarthritis you get them start riding a bike for 30 40 minutes a day and they keep at at it and working through it they actually have amazing effects and people come in and the pain's much better their function's much better if you've got weak quadriceps that's the main um, muscle of the front of your thigh you can't climb stairs very well your knee's much likely to hurt and then uh, you struggle and you get often then people get this vicious cycle of function gets worse they, uh, their knee hurts, they can't climb stairs, they stop doing things, they stop going out, they put on weight and they actually go backwards. And so you need to turn it around depending on the person and their habits and where they are. Uh, now, there are also medications to help people, but uh, they've had mixed success. There's some newer ones around, but I don't, uh, I don't pretend to have any expertise in that. So it depends on the person. If you're just moderately overweight, it's just, it's just changing your patterns, you know, cutting out... Uh, uh, your carbohydrates, so eating less uh, breads and these sort of things, and pasta, and just exercising more. Yeah, so it's, you know the basics. The basics. It's, yeah. And the trouble is, it's not easy. No. If it was easy. Everyone yeah. be doing it, yeah. and you need to have a lot regular follow up. You need somebody seeing them all the time. Like every month, they need yeah. to come back and have a discussion about it, and yeah. otherwise they fall off the wagon, and then and then they go back to the bad habits. And six months later, and this is just human nature, and I know I do it myself. You have all good intentions, and then suddenly six months rolled around and you haven't done what you're planning to do and, yeah, and good intentions they do not accomplish anything do they uh chris in terms of uh the other risk factor there for aging knees you mentioned sports injury and i know one of your current projects is looking at the national youth sports injury prevention program this is a very active listenership uh, for this program so uh any headlines that you can share with the listeners around best ways of preventing sports injuries now obviously your project's looking at i believe sub 25 year old uh, athletes but in general preventing the injuries yeah so the last 20 years there's been a lot of work around it and there's been increasing realization that just uh knowing that actually most knee injuries are preventable because most people who tear their acl it's not because they got ran into somebody or they knocked it they usually step at speed usually to avoid someone coming towards them and they step too hard they step too early they're off balance when they do it they might step in a pothole or something or they slip on grass and that's when they overload their knee particularly uh, the anterior cruciate ligament and it then tears that ligament because it's being overloaded and they have an event where we call it a, a valgus moment where the leg goes into a knock knee position and they tend to tear their acl and you can essentially happen as a, in the blink of an eye and it can happen very quickly and often you hear a pop or a snap and the person then is laying on the ground in writhing around in pain, they've torn their ACL and no one has touched them. Now 50 to 80% of those are preventable. You can actually train people three times a week with an agility program, it's about 20 minutes. And it doesn't quite matter exactly what you do but it just matters that you do some agility training, some core strength, some what we call proprioception and agility. And you can do it on balance balls, you can do it stepping. And there are programs available, uh, the soccer or football, uh, there's one called FIFA 11 Plus. You can download it, it's free, and you can, that's for soccer. Uh, we had one about 10 years ago with um, some of the uh, physios here on the Gold Coast uh, who we set it up, involved with the tides at that stage, um, called Power Step. And we set up a program. It was essentially a 12-step warm-up agility program, and that's available on, on the website 
for my rooms, and that was one we did for um, for rugby league, uh, rugby union, touch football. The there are others available. So there's sports specific ones, which and it really have to have some core things, and then you can each sport has to be different. So there's one called Footy First, which the AFL have done, and it's specifically designed around AFL because AFL is particularly a high risk of tearing your ACL. You basically it's a 360 degree game. It's like netball again, high risk. And those sports, uh, you need all the skills. You need the landing, the ball handling, the stepping, the core agility, all these things. Where say soccer, you need you don't need the landing component, um, but you need the ball handling, but not in your hands, but with your feet. So you need to change it a bit. When we did Power Step about probably eight nine years ago now, I realised that a, a community level program just doesn't work because it's very hard to get it running and to get it implemented. It just doesn't work like that. And so we tried to push it for a few years. And because most coaches and trainers at that level are volunteers, each dad each year like a new mum comes along or a new dad and they take over as coach and it falls away because it takes time. You need to do it. So the whole idea of what we call it's called Safe Sport for Kids is to get the Australian Sports Commission to uh, implement a nationwide uh, program of injury prevention through uh, a smartphone technology. So the smartphone has feedback, the program can be updated and adjusted, but also you have to log in, you have to log in, you're doing it three times a week as a coach and it's part of your accreditation. You can't be accredited as a trainer or coach unless you log into the app and you've done the course and then off you go. Uh, And the whole idea is to do it across a high-risk sport. So for every high-risk individual you expose to it, you uh, decrease their chance of ACL rupture significantly. So if you took 27 people and trained them or exposed them to it, that's uh, the smartphone. So the coach took essentially a team of 27 or two teams of, uh, you know, 13 or 14, then you would end up with uh, prevention of one ACL rupture per season in that group. So it's quite a powerful effect. So imagine just you train two teams, you you stop one ACL rupture per 27 individuals. And what happens is that then they don't tear their ACL, they don't get meniscus tears, they don't get knee osteoarthritis, they can do any job they like, they don't have to retire because they've got bad knees from being a carpenter when they're 45, and then they don't end up with a knee replacement. So it's a vital thing in that young, under 25 year olds age group. And the reason we chose under 25 year olds is just, it works for everybody, but that's the peak age of sports participation. As people get over, over 25, they just, much less and less likely to play touch football and mm. rugby and, and netball. So under 25, it's where the high participation is. And then the amateur ranks, um, that participation starts to really drop off after 20, 25. And, uh, you know, some listeners might think, well, Chris, you're an orthopedic knee surgeon. Uh, why do you care if there's lesser rates of uh, these traumatic injuries? Yeah, so like, you know, it's like why do dentists tell people to brush their teeth? Yeah. You know, it's the same <laughs> argument. Uh, and I did it because we just were seeing increasing numbers of young people with ACL ruptures. The hospital I work at, Pindara, uh, they now have a paediatric ward. And when I started, I don't remember really having many 13, 12 year olds with ruptured ACLs. Now I, I see them every couple of you know, every week. I see a rupture, uh, someone under 18. So it's becoming increasingly common. Not only that, but ACL ruptures and reconstructions in that age group have a much higher rate of re-injury. So if you're an 18-year-old male and you tear your ACL and you haven't reconstructed, your re-injury rate is around 20% to either that reconstructed knee or to the other one. So it's really high. And we have conferences like the Australian Knee Society. We had a conference a couple of years ago. And I remember a whole session was devoted to the adolescent ACL injury and how these young people didn't do as well. Their risk of injury was much higher. And we aren't really that great at actually reducing it. There's some interesting statistics. The two number one um, indicators of re-injury are age. And the second one is actually the slope of your tibia. So the higher your tibial slope is, and the magic figure's around 12 degrees out of some research out of Sydney, then you're much more likely to re-injure yourself. And it's very hard to actually decrease someone's tibial slope. It's it's not an easy thing to do, and it's quite hard to make them normal. So in those people, we don't have a great answer except changing sports. That's the way you're not going to hurt yourself again. But that's something hard to tell a 15-year-old who loves their footy and, and you know that's their whole life and the whole family is involved in the club or things like, things like that. Hey Chris, just on that, you mentioned that you know, you'll see someone less than 18 weekly almost with an ACL rupture now, whereas you know, fast rewind the clock, that wasn't the case. Why is that? 
So it's a couple of things. A, we're probably are better at diagnosing it. That's one thing. But the second thing is that young people are much bigger. They're taller and they're stronger and they're more muscular and they're less agile. And they're less agile because they're playing probably more computer games. So they're in on screens more, or they're watching television or something, and then they don't as play as much. So their free play is much less. Now, these are all theories. People haven't been able to work out a way to exactly define why it is, but it's probably those three things. It's greater recognition of the injury. The second thing is that young people are much bigger. And the third thing is that young people are less agile than they were in the past. They're more muscular. The more time you spend in the gym bulking up, the more likely you are to rupture your ACL when you go and play sport. That's remarkable. So just through the body mass. Body mass, but also probably then you less spend you spend less time working on agility. Yeah. But also you probably your action times are slower because you're bulkier. You know, you're carrying ten kilos more of muscle and you can't step as quickly. You look at guys playing rugby league in the seventies and eighties, they weren't massive guys, they were all mostly tradesmen. Yeah. And they worked during the week, they played on weekends. Yeah. They were not massive guys. They didn't go to the gym all day and their injury rates were much less. Yeah, well. And that, and that flows into the amateur ranks too. You look at Schools, you know, when my, my sons are the, the first 15, they're massive young men, they're huge. Like, they're probably all six foot plus, six foot five, and that's in the backs. And they are, they're 80, 90, 100 kilos, they're not small. Yeah, so those factors could combine to potentially drive this greater you know, prevalence. Well, I heard one of the uh, Brisbane GPS uh, front rows in the rugby weighed more than the Fijian front row or some crazy figure it is huge and so uh, kids are big I mean all my boys are going to be taller than me and uh, they're going to be more likely to hurt themselves Listen, there's a quick break from Dr. Chris Vichulo. today's episode as always is lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio We exist to help you perform at your physical best and we do this through our industry first fixed fee and unlimited access two, six and 12 week finish line programs. In addition to our popular finish line programs, we also offer patients monthly wellness boosters where patients can rehabilitate with a scope of services for very low monthly fees. In addition, we also offer our unique one-hour initial Discover Recover session, which is the best way to get your injury underway with an accurate diagnosis and effective immediate treatment. To find out more about Pogo Physio or our Pogo Partners program, bringing our finish line programs and wellness boosters and Discover Recover sessions to practices near you, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. And now back to Dr. Chris Vitulo. Chris, we've touched on ACL injuries, we've touched on knee osteoarthritis, uh, just, you know, meniscus and cartilage uh, injuries are often, you know, uh, in, amongst the listeners are often confusing. People will say, oh, I did a cartilage in my knee or, you know, can you just put listeners in the, uh, the box seat there, Chris, in terms of what the difference is and, you know, how might they know if they've upset one or the other? So... The term cartilage is uh, poorly used by surgeons and it's actually the uh, medical practitioner's fault for not really defining what they're talking about very well. So there's two types of cartilage. One is the articular cartilage and that's the smooth uh, cap of articular cartilage that sort of covers the ends of the bone. And that's the articular cartilage. When it starts to break down and thin out, that's what actually is osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is structural damage to uh, structural degradation of the articular cartilage. Now, osteoarthritis is a whole joint disease. So not only do you get the general changes to the articular cartilage, thinning, fissuring, cracking, softening, etc., you also get changes in the bone underlying it. It starts to get thicker. The bone plate gets what we call sclerosis, which is thickening and hardening because the cartilage isn't taking a load as well. And then we also get changes in the capsule of the joint. This is this soft tissue envelope that wraps around the joint to make it a space. And that starts to get 
thickening. Um, we get a whole bunch of inflammatory mediators in the knee, and then it starts to make more fluids. You end up with this swollen, puffy knee, and the bone changes. The bone starts growing what are called osteophytes, and they're little spurs on the side of the joint. And essentially, people say that the joint is trying to fuse itself, and that's what osteoarthritis is. So it's a whole joint structural disease process. As part of that disease process, you can get what we call atraumatic meniscal tears. So you get this structural degeneration of the meniscal cartilages, and that's the other type of cartilage. So there's meniscal cartilages and articular cartilage. Meniscal cartilage is a C-shaped shock absorbers that sit between the femur and the tibia. And when you get changes in them, they get uh, soft, they get uh, you know, structural tearing of them and uh, degenerative changes, and they start to extrude out of the joint. They actually start to come out of the joint as they lose their, uh, lose their ability to, to withstand the load. And that's all osteoarthritis. So I, get, I see people who are like 60, have had an MRI, and they've been referred along. They've got uh, an onset of no trauma but a, a sore knee, and on MRI they've got a meniscus tear, and say, please see this person for an arthroscopic meniscectomy. And... Most people who have that don't actually need an operation. And what they need to explain is this is the early onset of osteoarthritis of the knee and they need to start looking at their lifestyle and making lifestyle changes. Most people I see like that are overweight. As we mentioned, losing weight's really important. And people have done studies on those people with meniscus tears that come along, uh, they're atraumatic and they're non-repairable. You look at those in a study and, and compare them to people who've had uh, uh, physiotherapy, say a structured rehabilitation program like bike riding or something like that, versus uh, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy and go in and trim part of the meniscus away. Most people, uh, well, when you do a study, most people are no different whether they've had the surgery or the physiotherapy. There's no difference in outcome. So what we say is that most people with these atraumatic meniscal tears don't need an operation. And the second thing is that the people who come along getting osteoarthritis, uncomplicated osteoarthritis, an arthroscope's not going to help them at all. You know, going in and a clean out or a washout and all these things that people terms that people use, they just don't help people. And so we've got this situation where it needs to be explained, look, okay, you're getting some changes in your knee that are degeneration, it's early osteoarthritis, and the things you need to do are lifestyle changes. You need to lose weight, you need to exercise, etc. You might need some you know, pain relief tablets, things like that. And that's the key. And that's a really hard thing to turn around someone who's 60 who's, who's been overweight for many years uh, to turn around their life. It's quite difficult for them. And now they've got a sore knee, so they can't walk as much. They've got to find some, some other way of exercising and strengthening their muscles. And then there's the traumatic meniscus injuries, which you're obviously... Yeah. No, they're completely different. Yeah. So traumatic injuries are when you you can either get it when you're with, with or without ACL ruptures and posterior cruciate ligament ruptures and all these sort of things. And they're a different thing. They're a younger person on usually and they uh, have had a history of trauma something happens and then they're the ones that we try and repair so say i'm doing an acl reconstruction and the person's got a, a traumatic meniscal tear associated with it i'll go in and stitch the meniscus up so i will repair it a lot of people think confuse meniscal repair to meniscectomy meniscectomy is where you trim part of the meniscus away and then repair is where you actually stitch it so you're trying to preserve it because the more meniscus you can keep the better the person does the less risk of progression of arthritis and longer term all these sort of things and then chris uh in terms of joint replacement advancements i mean um uh, I first uh, met you around 2000, 2001, two. So, you know, we're talking close to two decades. What advances have you seen in the last two decades in joint replacement surgery for knees and what do you forecast to see in the coming decades? So this is actually my PhD topic and that's the effect of surgeon's preference for a particular type of knee replacements. What we've seen since I've been in practice is that we now... We had really good knees... 15, 20 years ago, we just didn't realise which were the good ones and which were the not so good ones because there's about 400 different brands and types of knee replacement. I think it's actually 506 in the Australian Joint Replacement Registry. And really, out of that, there's only about 7% of those that are actually got low risk of failure. 
and, and we now can define those much better. So when I started practice, we the Australian Joint Replacement Registry, which is a national registry of knee and hip replacement, it's a fantastic initiative, the Australian Orthopaedic Association, uh, and one of the best registry, if not the best, if not the best registry in the world. And it comes out every year and it shows us what's good, what's okay and what's not so good. And what's happened in the last 15 years is that we can now point to things that are not so good and go, okay, that is a prosthesis that does not do well. And you can identify that one and people stop using it. Um, so we now have been able to focus on the good ones, the ones that have much lower risk. And so the things that really uh, change that are particularly the... Um, design of it you know the the types of new replacements the other thing is the plastic so there's now uh polyethylene which is the bearing surface it's like your kitchen cutting board material but we use high density versions of it and in the last 15 years we now know that if you take that polyethylene and you irradiate it and, and heat it up uh, you sort of heat it to its melting point you actually uh, really dramatically reduce the wearing out of it and that has amazing effects. So if you reduce the particle wear debris from the articulating surface and the knee replacement, you get much lower failure. And one of the studies we just had accepted in one of the orthopedic journals, you get lower infection rates too. So not only longer term do you actually drop the failure because it doesn't come as loose and it doesn't wear out, but it also uh, drops the uh, infection risk by up to, you know, depending on the design and the bearing service, you can drop it down by up to uh, you know, 80, 90% less. So it's a, quite a dramatic difference. And so that's what one thing is the design's not so much different. We're just really working out what really matters and what doesn't matter so much. When I started practice, there were knee replacements of popular called mobile bearing knees, and they were introduced and everyone thought they were going to be fantastic and eradicate problems of wear. They didn't. And in fact, uh, they had a higher failure rate than the ones they replaced. So it's really important as surgeons to have these long registries. We can look back and go, okay, this was good. This wasn't so good. And then change our behavior for the better. So the second thing is uh, the biggest improvement is a drug called tranexamic acid. And it's an old drug. But what it does, it basically stops people bleeding. And that's revolutionised joint replacement surgery. We give a couple of tablets, they're about seven cents each, and we don't have to transfuse people anymore. And they don't have to have a big swollen knee or hip and lose blood and all this sort of thing because they just don't bleed as much. And that's had a dramatic effect on our practice as well. So we don't have to use drains anymore. Uh, the pain is much less. The, when I do a knee replacement, the person goes walking the night of the operation. So they get up and they go for a walk. And the next day they're, next day they're climbing stairs and then at home probably two days later on average when I started practice, people were in hospital six, seven days, these big, sore, swollen knees, consuming huge amounts of narcotic injections. And now we just use a patch. And so that's the other thing is pain relief mechanisms are much better. We use a patch, we put a block, we block their nerve, the saphenous nerve to the knee, and we use a patch and some just oral tablets, and they're up and around going home in a couple of days. Now, if people are listening to this about a knee replacement recently, they'll know that it's much better than it used to be, but it still hurts. And you get varying degrees. Some people say, oh, my knee never hurt at all. And then some people just have some, some low-grade pain. It was enough to bother them, enough to remark upon it. And there's a small proportion of people who struggle still. They're people who can't really tolerate opiates or they don't work well on them. But that's much less common. And so now we have much faster recoveries. Uh, we have less complications as a result. And we have uh, you know, happier patients. And that's just been the last couple of years. And so they're the three changes mainly. It's the choice of prosthesis. We're knowing what the important thing is. The drugs we use to stop the bleeding. And then also the better pain relief mechanisms. That we don't treat people like they've got an illness anymore. We treat them like they're having a, something done. And so they're trying to get them out of the illness model and get them up and get them out of hospital as soon as possible because the least time they're in bed and the least time that they're sitting in the hospital, the better they do. So I want people all try to go home in day two. And I don't think having... I think it's, we'll see quite soon in Australia people having same-day knee replacement surgery because it's actually quite possible to do. They just go home or they go to a hotel or something like that. 
Um, and I think that will probably move to, as we get better and better, uh, pain control mechanisms and uh, better recovery. We're doing a study here at uh, Pindara comparing two different types of rehabilitation in hospital. One is where people get on a pedals and ride and compared to another type where we just do a standard inpatient uh, physiotherapy program and we're about halfway through the well, probably three quarters of the way through the trial and we're going to then work out well is a pedaling program in hospital better than a standard physiotherapy program and it'll be interesting to see the results uh, when that comes i'm supervising um um, one, uh, the, Larissa, who's the head physio at, at Pindara, an orthopedic ward, and this is her uh, master's degree. And so I, I think it's a great project she's doing. It's yeah. fantastic. It'll be interesting to see the outcomes of that. And, and Chris, I mean, um, I recall, I think it might have been one of your lectures when I was at Griffith University back in the day uh, that, you know, people you know, will always do better generally the longer they leave joint replacement surgery if they can. Is that still current thinking or is it now shifting because of the fact that these breakthroughs have occurred? Mm. So when, you, when you're going to have a knee replacement, the, the key issue is is the pain. Mm. And the, I say that are you at the point where your pain is so bad that you can't put up with it anymore? Because it's not how bad the x-ray looks. That's not a good indicator of who to do. It's not how, you know, whether they limp or walk or whether their wife or husband's sick of them, you know, all the complaining about it. It's can you put up with the pain anymore or not? And I think it's, it's, it's a point where the younger the person is and the le- less amount of osteoarthritis they have, the more likely they are to be dissatisfied. So if you've got somebody who's got, you know, lots of pain but arthritis isn't too bad and they're under 55, they have about a 75% chance of being dissatisfied with their knee replacement. Conversely, the people who come in who do incredibly well are people who are 75, they've had a bad knee for many years and have just got to the point, their arthritis is severe on x-ray and they're really getting pain at night, really struggling. They in general do very well. And so it's not, it's, it, you can't, it's a bit of a simplification to say uh, hold it off as long as you can Similarly, uh, you don't want to go too early. So there's actually a, a Goldilocks point where your pain is bad enough, you've got quite severe arthritis on X-ray, you've tried to lose weight, you've tried pain control, you, know, you, you just can't put up with it anymore. That's the time to have it done. Yeah. And uh, Chris, shifting gears to come back to then sort of some you know uh, contemporary things like stem cell therapies, which I know listeners love questions around PRP, but shifting gears over to uh, something that's close to my heart, running. Uh, the loads associated with running, uh, you know, it, it can be this connotation about people wearing out their knees through running, and we all have our biases in practice. Um, I recall a quite decent sized study being done where they found that some form of running was protective against knee osteoarthritis just because of the fact that their exercise and their, their body mass index is generally better. Um, but running, I mean, um, for listeners, what, what are the insights from your? your desk in terms of well yeah so running running is a great um activity and there's no evidence if you were a history of being a runner your arthritis risk is higher than anyone else there's lots of studies on marathon runners and their rates of knee osteoarthritis are no higher Mm. so the whole idea of wearing out your knee is not true there is the biggest question is if you've damaged your knee say you tear your meniscus and you, you, know, you had to have a, something done to it or, or you've torn it and you're starting to get degenerative changes whether you should run and that's an unknown question and people just don't know and i think probably the answer is it depends on how much you weigh and then how bad your knee is but there is some weak evidence that running on a bad knee can actually cause progression of the disease process. So if you're running around a degenerate knee, probably not such a good idea if it's you know giving you pain. And I think I'd say to people, look, if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't swell up, and your, your body mass index is, is, is low, then I think it's probably okay. If you've got some degenerative changes, that's fine. But if your BMI is high and you've got degenerative changes, then probably not the best form of activity uh, and you should go and lose weight through some other way and then you might want to re- re- reconsider it there yeah. because you don't want to give yourself uh, bone marrow edema lesions. What they are is they're like stress reactions in the bone and they're actually very damaging for the joint. So it's a whole area that we haven't really quite uncovered as to 
who can run on a bad knee and who, who, who cannot. But I think in general, if it hurts and it blows up every time you run, you should probably avoid it. And the bone marrow edema, I mean, this is something close to my heart or my knee. Uh, I've, you know, I've had some, uh, I've been on your treatment table a couple of times in, in my running career, Chris, but um, in terms of um, the bone marrow edema, that's often a radiological sign that's reported on for the acute so, sorry, the, the running sport injuries, uh, people often see that written. How long does that take to, to disappear if the loading's reduced? It's, a, it's an open question, I know. Yeah, so there's three categories of bone marrow edema. There's ones that are essentially a, a traumatic injury, so the knee's been knocked, or when you tear your ACL, the knee essentially dislocates and the lateral side of the femur hits into the tibial plateau and you get this real bone bruise and sometimes even people can dent their bone they've got a dent in the femoral condyle so direct trauma is one mechanism the second one is um, repetitive injury and that is people who get stress reactions trying to run on an arthritic knee or you know i have a, a a patient who's uh, you know got terrible knees but he he's in he's an ex uh, you know world um world motorbike champion and he's got bad knees from injuries and but he's so fit that most of the time he gets away it doesn't hurt him because he's lean and he's fit however when he sometimes changes his activity he uh, you know goes for changes his walking pattern and walks more he gets these stress reactions in his bone and comes in with pain and so you see it with people getting these repetitive stress or micro fracture injuries and the third thing is one we don't understand, and that's people who are this unusual idiopathic category. And what idiopathic means is we just don't know why. And you get it in pregnant women, and you get it in some groups of people, they get these bone marrow lesions. We don't quite understand why they get them, and they get them all over the place. They get them in the knees, they get them in their hips, uh, and they're highly unusual. In the knee particularly, we used to think a lot of these are actually what we call avascular necrosis, where the bone actually lost its blood supply. And that may be a potential mechanism, but probably uh, it's more complicated than that. And particularly for one, say, I know someone's torn the meniscus and they get a, uh, a microtrabecular fracture and then a bit of the bone dies and collapses, that's actually not a, a blood supply issue. That's a mechanical load problem. There's too much load going through the joint because the meniscus has been damaged. So there's those three areas, those bone marrow lesions, and no one quite understands the idiopathic category, why people get these things. And patellofemoral pain, it's the umbrella term, obviously, which, you know, um, yeah, classic signs, stepping down things, down hills, down steps, that pain anterior mm-hmm. in the anterior region of the knee. And it's something in the physiotherapy world we come across all the time. Uh, for listeners, you know, that are exasperated with the sometimes long-standing nature of anterior knee pain chris any tips or insights you'd share from uh, the orthopedic surgeon's desk yeah so patellofemoral pain is is you're right it's a it's a term for all sorts of pain at the front of the knee now sometimes people have terrible looking patellofemoral joints on mri and x-ray and they get very little pain and other time people get severe pain and they're really struggling and it looks almost completely normal so there's not a great match between what the joint uh, surface looks like and the level of pain described. The second thing is that it does tend to occur more in people with weak quadriceps and probably tight hamstrings and, and weak hamstrings as well. So the muscle balance is really important and uh, probably the iliotibial band is, is also plays a role. The key here is that no one quite understands really the underlying issue of people getting patellofemoral pain when there's no real identifiable factor what's going on. And you get this subgroup of people who have severe pain because pain is just a subjective, unpleasant sensation. You can't measure it. Uh, you can just ask the person, how bad is it out of 10? They go, 10 out of 10, doctor. Or like spinal tap, it's 11. You know, it's that bad. And yet that person's appearance of their knee in the examination may be exactly the same as someone who doesn't get any pain at all or, or just 1 out of 10. So there's not a great understanding of some people why they get this anterior knee pain uh, and, it, and it's a struggle for them and I think the trouble is that much more research needs to be done to this because it's almost like a low grade pain phenomenon you know they get this aching and pain and it's quite debilitating particularly for some uh, young people who just get it can't play sport and we don't really understand why they get it what's the underlying pathology is actually poorly understood and in terms of uh, people that have run their full uh 
you know, gamut of conservative care. They've exhausted, you know, the strength gains they need to make around their quadriceps and, you know, the other bits and pieces uh, that do end up, you know, potentially uh, having surgery. There's different procedures that, you know, uh, you can potentially do bone marrow stimulation, you know, trying to help like a fibrocartilage scar of any cartilage lesion, different things like this. Yeah, so in general, we try and avoid operating on patellofemoral chondral lesions because the person who comes in and they've just got softening and cracking over the whole of the back of the patella. To going in and trying to smooth out or do something, you're just not going to help them. I remember being a training surgeon uh, with with one of the surgeons who was a mentor of mine and, and very well regarded, an excellent surgeon, but one operation used to do was sort of like shaving the grass because the back of the patella had all these uh, uh, rough bits and he'd go in and smooth it and it looked much better, but... Um, I really didn't think he was helping. I don't think he was helping people that much. And studies have subsequently shown that they're no better than having rehabilitation on those people. So the role of uh, microfracture, or you're really talking about how to fix up these chondral defects. So chondral defects that are well defined, that are uh, say about say less than a centimeter in size in diameter up to one and a half and the rest of the joints almost normal and they fail a non-operative rehabilitation program then then a micro drilling or a micro fracture is probably the accepted uh, standard and you can augment it uh, there's augmentation methods using bone marrow concentrate uh, prp you can use uh, you can also augment it using um Sometimes uh, we just did a study at the University of Western Australia trying to augment them. It was a sheep study we did, augmented with um, uh, like a collagen membrane. Uh, and so we're trying to look at these chondral resurfacing techniques. If they get bigger, then uh, there's a tech, there's old other techniques. There's one called a mosaic plasty where we take little dowels from one part of the knee and shift them over to the other. And I worked with... Uh, one of the surgeons in Toronto, Tony Miniachi, when I was doing my fellowship in Toronto, and he actually designed this technique of these little tiny plugs called a mosaic plasty. <coughs> then, then the other method is something called a, an ACI or a, a Macy graft, and that's where we grow the person's cells in a lab and we then use a collagen membrane and, and put that on. Now, that's a quite expensive, and the government about three or four years ago stopped... Um, that being done in the Medicare system because they felt that the benefits uh, of it weren't outweighed by the cost. You know, they're about $8,000 to just grow the cells. Recently in the United Kingdom, they've actually come out and recommended that as a form of treatment for people with a very specific set of circumstances. That is, they don't have osteoarthritis. They have this uh, chondral defect that's two or two and a half centimetres in, in diameter greater and they get ongoing pain, then they are candidates for a, a Macy graft. Um, but it's controversial. At meetings I go to, a lot of surgeons still believe, and I think it's a reasonable undertaking, that the evidence for it isn't really worth and it. It's not outweighed by the costs and the risks. You know, you have to open, you have to do two operations, one to harvest the tissue, the cartilage, to grow it, and the second to put it in. Listeners, I trust you're enjoying Dr. Chris Vichulo's share-ins. If you missed last week's episode featuring Spider Everett, then be sure to jump back to episode 85 in the archives and tune in. Spider's episode's been tremendously popular. Spider spoke through the highs, the lows, and the learnings of his prolific AFL sporting career. And Spider also touched on his debut marathon, of which I had the pleasure of running with him. So if you missed out, here's a little snippet, but be sure to go back, take a listen, and explore the archives. I reckon there was a guy there called uh, one of my mates, Mad Dog Cripps, Jason Cripps, actually ripped his hamstring off the bone twice. So he ripped it off the bone, had the op- had, had an operation, got it done, he was back at training, and he was a... He was a he was a club man as well, so he did everything for the footy club. And he wasn't blessed with skills, and he used to have a crack at everyone because he wasn't blessed with skills, but what he was blessed with was the ability to get himself absolutely right. He'd sleep in the spare room come Wednesday, you know, so he wasn't disturbed by his missus. His diet was to perfection, and he got himself right. And after he ripped the hamstring off the bone, he got it fixed, 12 months off, come back, training again, did it again.
Now, let's jump back with Dr. Vichulo. And this takes us to that stem cell therapy, obviously, world. You know, uh, the evidence for that is, you know, as you say, maybe isn't so compelling that it's the the holy grail that people can hang on to to, to solve all yeah, so I guess the conditions. thing about the term stem cells, as soon as you say it, everyone thinks it's going to be absolutely fantastic, and it depends on what you're talking about. So in Australia, everyone talks about stem cell injections. What they're actually talking about is uh, stem cells, like they're called pericytes, and they're little tiny cells that live around blood vessels. And they live around blood vessels in fat, and what, the, what it is, it's actually fat derived. So people have liposuction on their belly, and they have these little tiny uh, cells that all get sucked into a little uh, container and get injected into people's knees or shoulders or wherever. So it's adipose-derived stem cells. That's the only one that's really available in Australia currently. That has been shown so far not to work. So there's a company that's publicly listed and their own research shows that the people who got that versus the people who got the fake injection over one and two years, there was no difference between the two groups. And just where we're sitting here there's about five or six clinics within probably about 10 kilometers that'll offer that to you and i'll charge it between five and fifteen thousand dollars and it just doesn't work now what probably is people are getting a benefit is the placebo effect as soon as you charge people money for something and uh dress in a nice tie and and do painful things to them they think it's going to be a good thing and the second thing is that they're injecting platelet-rich plasma at the same time, which costs one twentieth, but actually does have a, a moderate, moderate effect on people. And you mentioned PRP earlier. So PRP is uh, where you take some patient's blood, you spin it in a special device, there's various ways to make it, and you end up with a uh, white cell depleted. So we get rid of the white cells, but platelet-enriched. And that's full of growth factors from the person's blood, basically. And when you inject that into joints, say in knees, they do better. Their pain is better and their uh, function is a bit better too. Now, it's controversial. Some studies show it's a you know, various in degrees of effect. But every study, there's been about 10 randomised control trials, and that's the gold standard in medicine. Randomised control trial is where you randomly allocate people to two groups, those who get it and those who don't get it. And the one who... And, and basically, blinding means that the people giving it to them don't know what, what they're getting, the people receiving it don't know what they're getting, and the people looking at the results don't know what they got. And then it's all hidden, and then you actually look at it right at the end and go, OK, who did well here? And when you compare it to fake saline injections, you compare it to other injectables, cortisone, etc. the PRP does surprisingly well and it's always better. The biggest controversy probably is the cost. You know, it costs between $300 up to $1,500 to have these injections. And the question is, is it worth it? And that's the biggest controversy. In the United States, it costs $1,500 to have a PRP injection. It's really expensive. In Australia, it's much less. Uh, it's around sort of three, four hundred dollars, uh, and so the cost benefit really changes depending on the cost. It's actually cheaper than being on some other forms of therapy, particularly there's other injectables called Synvisc or hyaluronic acid. It's more effective than that, and it's about the same price or cheaper. And so PRP is uh, something that has been shown, uh, and, and in quite a few studies, and it's I think you'll see an increasing role for it, and to be increasingly recommended in guidelines, because the guidelines go on evidence, and there's now quite a significant amount of evidence showing it's beneficial. The problem with it is the cost, and then the effect size. And what would effect size is the term is how effective is something, you know. So the effect size of, say, anti-inflammatory tablets is pretty small. It's around 0.2. Mm. The effect size of Panadol or Paracetamol is even harder to measure. It's almost not worth taking. The effect size is so small. The effect size of a knee replacement is massive. It's like four. You know, it's really a big effect. Um, and the effect size of PRP is around probably 0.4. So it's effective, but you have to argue for each individual person you know, it's much better to go and lose weight and exercise because they're both free. They don't cost anything. Uh, and then reserve your PRP for people who are happy to pay for it or people who can't take anti-inflammatories who, you know, are struggling. And there's about an 80% response, so not everybody gets a response. The, 
And what we mean by response is you probably have a measurable response if you did it to 100 people, but on an individual level, about 20% of people don't really notice a difference. And those who don't are much more likely to have severe osteoarthritis. I mean, on x-ray, their bone is on bone. And they don't get quite a good response. So the better responder of the PRP are those that have mild to moderate disease. And you'll, you've seen the last three or four years increasing uh, recommendations that it should be part of an armamentarian, but it's not the be and all. Uh, and people come along saying, I want an injection, but I say, look, okay, that's great, this is it, this is the evidence, but you'd be much better off losing weight, exercise. And if people are manual labourers, golfers, uh, you know, then I put them in braces as well, and they help unload the damaged compartment, um, and they are effective. And your typical P- PRP protocol, Chris, is... Is it one that you sort yeah, of so follow? We, we would do it a month apart. Oh, the sports um, doctors here at the office does do, but um, the, you, there's some offering th- two or three. You know, you probably one one's not quite enough to have a beneficial effect, and so just depending on two or three, and it also depends how you prepare it. Uh, there's cheap ways using just basically test tubes. Uh, but you then end up not having the... You don't get rid of the white cells and your concentrate is really only about 1.4, 1.7 times concentrate where if you use proper commercial systems that unfortunately cost more money, you get rid of more white cells and your concentrations can be four or five times higher. Chris, uh, 3D printing. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, PR that that gets. Uh is that playing a role in your practice at this stage anyway, or do you see it playing play a role? So for orthopedic surgery about five years ago, there were something called patient-specific instruments, and they were actually 3D-printed instruments designed individually to match up to the person and for knee replacement. And they were a, a solution, uh, rather than using, say, computer navigation, which took a bit longer, a bit more mucking around, they were introduced as sort of like a poor man's easier um, way to align a knee replacement. Unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of errors in post in making the... So you've got you to measure them off an MRI, you've got to then make it, you've then got to put it on the patient, fit it properly, and then use it to guide your, uh, guide your sort of resections of the bone. And what we've seen through our registry, as I mentioned earlier, is that those people who've had PSI, on average, are either doing no better than just old-fashioned standard instruments or, in fact, worse. And so depending on the brand used, there are actually people who are getting worse outcomes, they're getting higher risks of failure associated with the risk of the PSI. So there's some areas where it really has been great, and that is for complex deformities. You, know, you can print out a, a bony deformity and print it and have a look at it and go, OK, how are we going to fix this? So, again, it depends on the technology, you know, and how it's applied. But, again, the trouble with a lot of this is a lot of hype associated with it and a lot of, uh, you know, it's okay if it works out and it's better, fantastic. But, unfortunately, uh, a lot of patients I saw, I never actually did it, but thought they were getting a custom knee replacement, but it never was. All it was was a custom way to put it in, like custom cutting guides, and they've been a real dud that is actually have worse outcomes for patients even though people still use them and it does depend on uh, the brand so there's brand differences in how they make it and you know so it's a bit of a complex issue but particularly some ones were measured off uh, MRI scanning or and plain x-rays uh, have worse outcomes than just using old-fashioned standard instruments Interesting. Chris, uh, bringing this into a close two questions what, what are Dr. Christopher Chulo's three tips for people to promote knee health across their lifespan? Well, I think the first thing is when you're young and you're playing sport is to be agile and warm up, but not warm up in terms of stretching, but warm up three times a week in terms of stepping, agility, those sort of things. And know your level. People hurt themselves because they uh, you know, can't ski very well and their friends take them on a black run on the second day and then they hurt themselves. So try and stay out of hurting themselves. The second thing is you move into um, middle age is not to get overweight, and that's really important. And you know, because as you get more and more overweight, you actually accelerate the aging process. And if you're 50 and your BMI is 50, you're in a really difficult situation. It's really a hard place to get yourself out of. It's not easy, you know. And and so the key is to, to maintain a, a low or a, a good body mass index. And then the third thing is, uh, you know, try and avoid surgeons if, unless you absolutely have to. 
I think uh, it's clear that uh, the people I see uh, who you know coming in for operations, are, I really say, look, you know, are you really bad enough for this? Because everyone thinks that every operation is going to have a fantastic outcome and they're going to be completely normal, but that's not anywhere near the truth. You know, these are these they work well. They've got people got severe pain and they're really struggling. It's a fantastic life changing operation, but. If you get an occasional ache after you play 36 holes of golf and you're, you're overweight and you haven't really exercised very much and you smoke and you drink too much, well, you really got to address your lifestyle factors. And if you lost the weight and you, your pain will go away. And that's the key. So I think realisation that uh, as people get older, they need to stay active. And this is this whole thing about exercise as medicine. And it's true. Exercise is fantastic medicine. And if you take people who are on you know, all the, the statins and the high blood pressure tablets a lot of people, I'm not saying all but a lot, uh, once they take away their truncal adiposity and they start exercising every day all those medical problems go away in a large variety of situations. So a lot of people I see have a condition called metabolic syndrome have you heard of metabolic syndrome? And you would through your uh, very lovely wife, she probably deals with a lot but I see people who are, have truncal adiposity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol um, and and, uh, and bad knees and it all goes together and it's all about uh, being more active and eating less and you know, perhaps even considering interventions if they need to. Chris, on being more active, every guest of the program, including the expert editions, issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. It can be entry level. Uh, to, so what's Dr. Chris Vichulo's uh, physical challenge to listeners for the week going to be? Physical challenge. Well, I guess uh, I think talking about being active, so I think it's about you know trying to uh, you know do uh, your ten thousand steps. I guess so, uh, be active. Great, ten thousand steps. And uh, Chris, if listeners want to follow, find out more about your work, you know, um, find you uh, here at the, the practice. Where's the best place to check? check well, they can uh, look up the website. It's www.kneesurgeon.net.au. Uh, I think there's a knee dash surgeon. Just Google my name and uh, you'll find it. Yeah. And listeners, we'll tag up all these links in the show notes, so jump over and have a look at those. So Chris Vichulo, Dr. Chris Vichulo, thanks very much for your time. And uh, listeners are so much better off in terms of their knowledge of knees now. Uh, thank you and all the best for the future and uh, that upcoming uh, tour of Spain on the bike. Oh, thanks, bro. Yeah, it'll be tough. <laughs> So listeners, there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust you enjoyed Dr. Chris Vichulo's sharings. If you did, then please forward the episode on to someone. It's as simple as hitting share from within your favorite podcast, player, or app, and sharing that away with anyone you know that would benefit from this information. Massive thank you to the faithful listeners who have been leaving reviews. Reviews help the Physical Performance Show get into the earbuds of more people who, just like you, are looking to perform at your physical best. A massive thank you to, in particular, Matt Gandy, who has rated the program five stars this week. Matt's comments, love the format of this podcast, different to most with the performance round and various other questions that are thrown around. Loved hearing the Siri Lindley interview and the Bernard Legat interview was just something special. Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to leave a review. And listeners, if you'd like to formally review the program, then you can do so through iTunes on your desktop. Simply search for the program, The Physical Performance Show, and hit ratings and review and rate away. If you'd like to refer to the show notes, listeners, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. We'll link up everything related to Dr. Chris Vichulo's work and also some interesting articles related to the things we discussed today. So be sure to head over there for further resources. And lastly, if you're into running, you can now pick up your copy of my Amazon running and jogging bestseller, You Can Run Pain-Free, over on Audible or iBooks. You Can Run Pain-Free is also available in Kindle or paperback versions from Amazon internationally or Pogo Physio domestically in Australia. Listeners, next week on the Physical Performance Show, I catch up with Emma Pallant, a great British long-distance triathlete who is taking the triathlon world by storm. In 2017, Emma finished second in the World 70.3 Ironman Triathlon Championships 
and has been a six times Ironman 70.3 podium triathlete internationally and also a two time duathlon world champion in 2015 and 2016. What makes Emma's story so unique and interesting is that in 2012, Emma actually underwent knee surgery, which ruled her out of an ongoing and promising Great British mid to long distance running career and threw her over to triathlon. Emma takes us through her first triathlon and the highs and the lows and the many learnings she's had on her way to international success in next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show. Look forward to hosting you then. Until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.